Hello, everyone. Welcome to another screening series Q&A. My name is Camelia Shofani, and I'm the Senior Manager of Public Programs and Events at the International Documentary Association. For blind or low vision attendees, I want to visually identify myself. I have dark hair in a bun, light skin, dark eyes, and I'm wearing a black shirt. I want to thank uh, our media sponsors for bringing this series to you all, Variety and KCRW. This evening, we'll be having a conversation between film critic Janelle Riley and director Tanya Lee Lewis, sorry, Tanya Lewis Lee, and Paula Eiselt uh, about their film Aftershock. For more information on our screening series lineup and Q&As, please visit documentary.org forward slash screening dash series. Before we get started, I'd like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. We recognize the Gabrielino Tongva as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land, water, and cultural resources in the unceded territory of Los Angeles. Thank you, Andrea, <laughs> for delivering that intro. And with that, I give it away to Janelle. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much for joining us for this IDA conversation with Aftershock. At this time, I'm so pleased to welcome today's guests. We have co-directors Paula Eiselt and Tanya Lewis-Lee. Also joining us is ASL interpreter Andrea Lust. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, whenever I have people as accomplished as you are, I actually love to go back to the beginning and sort of ask, where did it all begin for you? What was your first job in this industry? Were you someone who, you know, started out as a PA on sets or were you instantly a, a filmmaker and producer? I just, I, I love to hear origin stories. Um, and why don't we start with Tanya? That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's funny, I wanted to be uh, in TV and film, but I took a path uh, as an attorney. So I was a lawyer first, uh, but my first job in the industry was actually uh, producing and directing some PSAs for Nickelodeon on Black History Month. Uh, I had a friend who was a lawyer who was practicing law, who was legal counsel at Nickelodeon, who invited me in for an exploratory interview when I said I wanted to produce. And uh, they gave me a little job and that's how I got started. Wow, that's so cool. What a nice, what a nice intersection of your interests too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and Paula, for you? Yeah, I, I um started in high school I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker and um, needed to learn how to do that uh, so I started to intern when I was 16 um, at a casting company called Bernard Chelsea Casting they do a lot of Broadway shows and um, I worked very long hours as an intern there and um, and then the next summer I ended up um, interning for Darren Aronofsky because I was like really into his films and that was a real privilege. So that was my first uh, foray into the industry. Wow, Bernie Telsey is like one of the biggest New York casting directors I can think of. That's pretty impressive right out of the gate. It was a very cool experience, especially as a teenager going to all those like after parties, it was eye-opening. <laughs> and Darren Aronofsky is no slouch either, I should add. That's that's really cool. Um, well, that brings us to Aftershock, which premiered at this year's Sundance Film Festival, where it won a special jury award, Impact for Change. Um, I'm curious for each of you how you sort of first became aware of really the startling statistics around the U.S. maternal mortality rate and, and what was the genesis or spark or, or idea for the film? And I actually don't know where it begins with. So whichever one of you wants to start is fine. Yeah, I think I we have our own journeys to, to, the, to the nexus together. But go ahead, Paula, I cut you off. Yeah, no, no problem. So um, I, I came to the, the topic overall and, and maternal health um, due to my own experiences in the maternal health system, having my four children. So it was something I was very in tune with um, how terrible our system is, but it wasn't until the end of 2017 when ProPublica released a slew of articles really exposing the U.S. maternal mortality crisis to the media, I say, because um, women and especially Black women have known about this for decades, um, but the media became alert about it in 2017. And that's when I also uh, 
realized that that what I was experiencing on an individual level was really impacting Black women in really profound ways and that we are the most dangerous country in the industrialized world to give birth in. And that just shocked me to my core. And I immediately just wanted to find a way to uplift these stories and, and use my skill set as a filmmaker to do that. So um, I started researching, um, I, I pitched the project to Concordia Studio, um, became a fellow, got some development funding, and at the same time was looking for a partner um, to really embark on this massive uh, journey with and um, was talking to all sorts of people. Um, but it wasn't until uh, an early development shoot that I met Tanya and became aware of who she is and her work um, in both the film industry and the maternal health advocacy field. And um, we met and had coffee about a week later and here we are. And Tanya, yeah. for you? Yeah, for me, I mean, you know, it really starts back in 2007. I had written a couple of children's books and the US Department of Health and Human Services asked me to be a spokesperson for an infant mortality awareness raising campaign here in the United States. And uh, that's where I had the opportunity to find myself immersed in a world of women's health. Because of course, when you're talking about women's health, you're talking uh, infant's health, you're really talking about a woman's health. And we were focused on uh, the disparity there. Infant mortality in this country has a high um, uh, disparity. Black babies die at three times the rate that white babies do. And of course, you're talking about a woman's health. And so, I was talking to groups of women and inevitably heard stories. Um, and as Paula said, uh, people in the community have been knowing about the high rates of maternal mortality and especially uh, the inequity and the disparity. And so I was hearing it firsthand. Uh, I did a small film uh, on infant mortality back then and had been thinking about also, like Paula, how, how to crack this film and had been talking to lots of people and was really excited when I met her. Um, and, and found our shared passion for the issue of maternal health and specifically for focusing on the inequity and the disparity in the United States. Do you find, this, this is one of those films where I feel like I should have known about this and I really didn't and I was, I was shocked. I was shocked to learn this was happening in America in modern day. Do you find that when, you know, telling people about this film, when people are seeing this film, that they are pretty floored, frankly? Yeah, I think that people are really surprised to hear that the United States is the most dangerous industrialized nation in the world to give birth. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I, I think that people are not surprised that there's inequities and disparities. But when you really start looking in and, and paying attention to the birthing industry in this country um, and, and you really peel the layers back, I think people are pretty shocked. Uh, at the condition that our birthing industry is in right now. I think I was trying to make myself feel better for being <laughs> so oblivious to this. <laughs> You're not alone. You are okay. definitely not alone. <laughs> uh, you have these two amazing subjects, Omari and Bruce, who both lost their partners in childbirth. Um, there's so many different ways you could have approached this movie. I'm sort of curious, how did you first connect with them and, and then go about uh, you know, making them sort of so prominent in the film and, and build that trust that's so obvious in the movie? That's yeah. a good question, sorry. <laughs> I'll take the first part of it. Um, so we, the way we met um, Omari and Bruce was through Shawnee Benton Gibson, um, who is Shamani's mother. Um, Shamani is one of the women who died a preventable death. Um, and we focus on her story in the film. And in December, December of 2019, Shawnee and Omari um, put on an event called Aftershock, um, the namesake of the film, uh, a mere two months after Shamani's passing to celebrate her life um, and also raise awareness about this issue and create a space for the community to come together. And so we connected with Shawnee and she agreed right away to allow us to film it, which was incredible. And then from there connected with Omari, of course, who's Shamani's surviving partner. Um, at that event, Omari had already created a men's circle. It was like a separate event within the Aftershock event to bring men together um, to talk about maternal mortality and talk about, you know, um, 
what, what it's like to be left behind when your partner dies. So that was already something that he envisioned from the start. And when we saw that, it was a no brainer that of course we need to follow the men because they're the partners are the ones left behind. It's the most obvious obvious thing but you know unfortunately people view maternal health as a women's issue so seeing men especially black men is is surprising to people um which also speaks to lack of representation of black fatherhood on screen so um it was a very organic process um for tani and i to to follow these two amazing men and um and then when when bruce's partner amber passed away in April, 2020, um, Omar is the one who reached out to Bruce and, and to help him. And that's how we connected with Bruce. Can I ask as co-directors sort of how the partnership works? Do you split up interviews? Do you have one person sort of assigned to do them? Um, it just seems like there's, there's such an obvious and organic trust that these subjects have when speaking to the camera. Yeah, I think we we mixed it up. Uh, it was really, I, I think we really formed great relationships with the people that we filmed and worked with. Uh, and so there were some interviews that we split up and there were some that Paula would take and some that I would take. It's just, it's we just sort of, I don't know. We didn't really put a put a, anything in a hat, but we just sort of figured it out as we were doing the research and going over the questions. I'd love to know just sort of the logistics of shooting the film, uh, when you began, uh, how many hours of footage you had to work with, <laughs> um, you know, how long the shoot was. Yeah, well, we started um, uh, us together, like in earnest, December 2019, as Paula mentioned, on that shoot with Omari uh, and Shawnee at that Aftershock event. Um, and so, yes, we went through the pandemic, uh, which certainly was uh, a challenge, uh, but we we were able to make it work. We filmed... Um, you know, when we went down, we gave iPhone cameras to uh, our main uh, protagonist so that they could film uh, when we were in full on lockdown. Uh, the moment we were able to come back out, we uh, began filming outside and then in very small crews uh, in, in their homes or inside. Uh, and we left some of the bigger um, set pieces, if you will, like hospitals and things like that, we were able to film, you know, later, later down the line. Uh, we did have a lot of footage. There were a lot of different ways this film could have gone. Uh, thank goodness we had two amazing editors on board, Flavia D'Souza and Sunita Prasad, who were able to really wrangle um, all of the different ways in which this film uh, could have gone. It was, it was quite, uh, Flavia called it the, uh, what did she call it? The the eight armed <laughs> octopus. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot, uh, but it but it was an amazing. It was great that we had so much to work from. I'm curious from a storytelling point, like, do you walk in with an outline, or do you just sort of have ideas, and then does it really come together in the editing process? Yeah, I, I mean, our our guiding principle was that this is a lived experience driven story. Um, we really didn't want to make a talking heads film. So it was really finding those amazing protagonists, those stories that would really connect with people um, more than the statistics. And then we do have some statistics, but they really come um, to bolster the stories of, of the human beings we're following. So though you know, um, Shawnee, Omari, Bruce, Felicia, like those, they're the hearts of our story. And of course, um, Amber and Shimani, and then everything else came secondary. Um, in terms of our two experts that we do have, um, Dr. Neil Shaw and Helena Grant, um, we we really were very careful to limit who, who those people would be, um, limit the number and what their roles were in the film. So we knew we wanted very specific people who would tie into the story. Um, Neil ties into um, with Bruce because he had reached out to Bruce um, also, and he's a very, you know, he's a big presence in the maternal health community. And Helena Grant um, is based in Brooklyn where a lot of the story takes place. So it was very organic to have her talk in, in our film. So we were very particular with the casting, I would say, like the casting really led our decisions and then um, everything else came secondary in terms of the information we wanted to convey. 
And the only other thing I'd add to that is we really wanted everyone to see these women alive. So seeing Shimani at the beginning as an alive human being with a robust you know, uh, experience was really important to us as well. So in many ways, is the story sort of revealing itself to you as well as you're filming? In some ways, yeah. Yeah. I we mean, did a lot of Felicia's, right? Yeah. Felicia's is like, you know, exactly. we're following um, Felicia's, the pregnant woman who ends up, thank God, having this incredible birth. And we didn't, we, you can't plan that. You can't write that, you know? So we really uh, went with the flow with Felicia. She initially wanted a hospital birth and then pivoted to a birthing center birth. And, and we just followed her lead. So that was, that was definitely a storyline that was like really intensely revealed to us that we could not have anticipated. And I got to say the history too. I mean, we were very fortunate in that we met Helena Grant, the midwife who in the film tells us a lot of history uh, of midwifery and, and, and birthing in this country. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think we expected her to give us information, but she began to open up and talk to us and, and we learned more than we ever anticipated. So true. I'm kind of curious about that because uh, the movie is is it's so well assembled and it covers so much. Um, but as filmmakers, are there things that maybe you just couldn't include because it interrupted the flow or it just didn't fit that you you know sort of wish people could see? Like a hundred things for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so much. I mean, exact. We the the history as Tanya said. Like when we were filming that interview, we looked at each other. We're like this can be the film, this one interview, like this, can, this is its own film. And um, it was a struggle to really cut that interview down and, 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 and focus that history because there is so much history and midwifery in this country that we did not get to cover that we would have loved to cover. Um, there's, you know, there are other birthing people that, that we would have wanted to include that had different kinds of births um, that we couldn't include. So this is just like a I think for us, like a slice of, of this overall topic, like there are so many stories that need to be told um, about birthing in America. So that, yeah. Yeah, we spent quite a lot of time in many different hospitals, um, you know, in New York, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Boston, Massachusetts. And I think that there, there, there was a lot there too. But again, as Paula said, you know, you did have to really focus the story. Um, and um, and that's what we did, but yeah, there's there's a lot there that we left on the table. <laughs> this is a very broad question, but for each of you, what was the most challenging part of making the film? A particular scene, or a particular story beat, or maybe just you know, dealing with a subject matter day in and day out can you know be very hard. For me, I would say uh, there was a woman who was not in the film who was pregnant and uh, thought she was in labor and went through a very sort of, I, I you know, she had, the story ended up well for her. The baby is great. She's great. I think she ended up having a very good birth, uh, but there was a moment that felt a little precarious and very nerve wracking for, for us. And, and that was very difficult um, in multiple ways, right? Because we were concerned for her we we were concerned about what could we do not do as filmmakers in the situation so it was a little it was a little dicey but thank god everything worked out really well yeah i mean that that's a really good example of, of, a, of a real challenge like the ethics of documentary filmmaking um for sure that that's a really good one i think you know in terms of other challenges like I, the subject matter is very heavy and intense um but i will say we took so much strength from shawnee omari and bruce that you know when we saw the work that they're doing day in and day out and what they're able to accomplish it it really was very inspiring it was like you know we got to do the work they're doing the work so that that was that was very helpful i think the you know navigating um the hospitals in certain ways and just just the pandemic of course you know definitely was a challenge to us but allowed us to then be more creative as you know many people say we had to make certain choices and we had to work with what we got so um it ended up being you know a good thing but definitely the speed in which we worked and within the constraints we worked um it was a lot to do 
I actually love asking filmmakers if there was anything that they had to adopt during the pandemic that they're actually going to use going forward. Because I do think, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. And sometimes you learn you can do things. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good question. I think, I, I think, you know, at least for me, and I think Tanya too, like our, our goal when making this film was deep collaboration with our protagonists, like that we were telling the story together. That being said, I think the pandemic allowed us to lean into that even more because we it was it became a, like a serious collaboration in terms of you know as Tanya mentioned the iPhones and and just you know really putting camera in, into our protagonist's hands and, and figuring out together how to capture a story within with this crisis that was going on so um that spirit of collaboration I think is something that I will take with me to other projects and um and I don't think we would have, I would have dug as deep if it wasn't um, the pandemic. I think for me, one of the things with that was fascinating, which I, I'm sure to some filmmakers is going to be blasphemous, but we were able to edit this film remotely, which is unbelievable. Like when we first thought about the fact that we were going to have to edit this film remotely, it was, we were like, oh my, how, 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 how is that going to actually be possible. And I will tell you that the way we worked, it was it was really interestingly efficient and worked really well. Uh, I don't know that I will would adopt that for always going forward, but I will say it worked in a way much better than I could have ever imagined. And if I had to do it again, I would be very open to it. Agreed. Um, another sort of broad question, but what are you hoping people take away from those film, this film? And for those who, who do want to help or get involved, are there any specific resources you can point them to? Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, that's always a, that, that question, what do you want people to take away from the film is always a, a tricky one in a way, right? Um, you know, we want people, I want people to feel something. Let's put it that way. I want you to feel something. I hope people are move to action in some way. I, I don't want to say that people should come away with one thing specifically, uh, but it is my hope that um, when people leave the film, they feel like they should find a way to do something to improve birthing outcomes for all people in this country. And I'll say similarly, you know, I really hope that people come away knowing that there's choice around birthing, that there's not one way to birth. Um, we've been told there is, but every other country, Western country, non-Western country has a myriad of options um, in terms of providers, in terms of settings, and that this is an autonomous decision. You have rights over your body when you're birthing, you don't give it away. And I hope that women and birthing people feel empowered um, that they do have that human right to make those decisions. So. Absolutely. Well, it is it is such a fascinating and compelling documentary that you've put together. I want to remind everyone you can also stream it now on Hulu. <laughs> um, thank you again so much for being here. And thank you, everyone at home for watching. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you.